I think the the story that you were referring to was actually the story of, of my hiring at Liberty. I, I knew the person who was offering me the position, but I didn't know deeply, deeply about the company's position. And so in my interview, I kind of said, this is what's important to me. I hope Liberty's there with me. If they're not, please don't hire me. My title is National Director of Programs. Uh, as stated, my name is Claire Shaw, and it's nice to be here with everyone. I've been at the Liberty Mutual Foundation it will be seven years in June, and uh, it's the second corporate foundation that I've worked with trying to make change. I'm a pretty intuitive person, uh, so some of that has evolved over time in terms of my leadership style. Like, I mean, I read um, books, I talk to colleagues, but I, I also am pretty um, grounded uh, in my own worldview and my own principles, for better or worse. Beyond her work at Liberty Mutual, Claire Shaw gives back to her community in so many other ways. Throughout our conversation, it was evident that she acts with extreme intention and purpose through everything she does. After learning a little bit about Claire's background and outside work, we dove into some important facts about her reality at Liberty Mutual and the general structure of public versus private organization. I had a 10-year gap. I just forgot. This is actually my third corporate foundation. Um, sorry. I think that working in the corporate uh, sector obviously affords more resources. If you need a new iPhone and you're in a corporation, you get a new iPhone. Uh, if you're working with nonprofits or you're working uh, in other smaller foundations that may not have the resources, it's more of a discussion of look at the budget, figure it out. And uh, you also have the additional resources of being able to pull in work from colleagues in corporate communications or brand strategy or corporate graphics or, you know, whatever else you need to get your work done. You're obviously also working within the parameters that are set for the corporation about its own identity and what it wants to do. So it's very different. I think the hardest job that I ever had was when I was working at Boston Public Schools uh, and working for um, the public sector. That was the second time I'd worked in a public setting. I'd worked for five years at the Massachusetts um, Council on the Arts and Humanities, which is now known as the Mass Cultural Council, and also, um, as I said, the stand at the Boston Public Schools, which was about two and a half years. And when you work for the public sector, there are very definite expectations from uh, folks. I don't think anyone's ever spoken to me the way they did when I worked for the, in a public sector. I mean, between screaming and other demands. And you are also aware that you are, um, co combined with that is an incredible public trust and accountability, so I don't mean to be flippant about it. Uh, you have the ability to really make things better where you can, and you're working in a you know, very close collaboration with a lot of other colleagues, the majority of whom are also there for the same mission. Uh, it is very much a camaraderie of people who came to do the work um, to improve things for society, and you get that sense and uh, you feel compelled every day to try and do your best. Impact is great potential, but also great possibility for things to go south quickly <laughs> on a daily basis. And so you kind of go in with two agendas. One is what you hope you'll accomplish, accomplish uh, for the day, and the second is what are the fires that I'm going to have to put out that I didn't know were even coming at me. Uh, all the while trying to manage a long-term strategy and accomplish longer-term goals. I have a lot of colleagues who've worked in private foundations. It really is, uh, particularly in the greater Boston area, because most of them are smaller, uh, a family feel. And you do a lot of work with the donors. You do a lot of work with the families that have established it or the trustee board. 
Uh, frequently they have community advisory committees and so you have different opportunities to get closer to the root of the problem and also to perhaps shape uh, first and second generation theories about giving and about uh, generational response to issues in society. After discussing overarching sectors in philanthropy, we dug deep on Liberty Mutual and some of its COVID response tactics. Well, when when things first became evident in late March of uh, last year that things were going to definitely be shifting because of COVID-19, I have, was drawing on probably two or three years of conversations with our nonprofit partners. We had done a few surveys. We had had some convenings of folks that uh, we funded and just conversations out and about. We knew that people were feeling constrained by the restrictions of donor gifts. And uh, so one of the first things we began to do when uh, when COVID began was I think we were one of the first foundations to lift restrictions off of any grants that had been made in the two years prior um, that would allow organizations to, uh, for 2019, 2020, to take restrictions off grants and use funds as needed. Because obviously the first thing you want to do in a time of crisis is allow the organizations to keep the lights on. Liberty is a foundation that up until then was probably more 80% program and 20% general operating. Um, Sent out a very quick letter saying, just send us an email by the end of March and you can use the dollars as, as you need. And for many organizations, we then quickly shifted to probably more like 50 50 uh, in terms of operating and program. The other thing that the foundation did was to establish an emergency fund initiative. We had a really quick application that could be submitted uh, with just drop-down menus. In 20 minutes, we timed it, uh, which would allow organizations to ask for up to $10,000 for uh, emergency things for COVID, which would be for cleaning, emergency hazard pay for staff, remote uh, remote learning, other things. And those grants were turned around within a week, all of them. And we switched to wire transfers uh, to get money to people more quickly. And by the time we closed that fund out in the summer of uh, 2020, I believe we had made a little over 350 grants around the country. The only pre prerequisite was that Liberty had to have funded the organization before. The Liberty Board gave the foundation an additional $10 million, both in 2020 and 2021, specific to COVID. Uh, but Liberty also made some very intentional grants around social justice in the summer, a million to the Museum of African American History here in Boston over two years and a million to the Equal Justice Initiative for uh, research and their work in general. They're um, very progressive, as you know, and doing some wonderful work, including research that's going to bring them to Boston. So that will be interesting in terms of what what that unveils. And beyond that, I think very close to my heart is that 2,000 Liberty employees got together on a town hall to talk about racial justice, and the company's only like 42,000. So that was a large number of our employees, and it was very heartfelt. And um, many of them also gave their own money through a matching gift drive. There were about seven organizations that were selected as options for them, a Color of Change and a bunch of others. And, um, you know, a large number of employees gave their own dollars to that as well. So uh, it was a time, I think, when people have been reflective and will continue to be reflective about 
what the future of the country holds and what social justice means for all of us. In addition to all of the education about Liberty Mutual, we also learned so much from Claire's experiences and observations alone. In terms of what I saw with the nonprofits that we were supporting was just incredible responsiveness. Um, you know, there's an organization that you may know of in East Boston called Zumix that does music education. And all of a sudden they had shifted to food delivery and diaper delivery and formula delivery. Uh, people were doing just incredible hours in terms of the amount of time they were at work and also just stretching their mission to the utmost, just trying to continue to keep in touch with their stakeholders and constituents. If they were working with youth, like Friends of the Children, they weren't just working with young people. All of a sudden, they were in a very intentional two-generational mode. So they were not just working with the young people enrolled in the program, but with the whole family in terms of resources. Commonwealth Table that used to be an incubator for organizations that were interested in getting into food service switched to Common Table where they were getting resources from about 300 community members, chefs, food truck owners, uh, ingredients uh, purveyors, etc and delivering cooked meals, uh, targeting public housing developments. The degree of collaboration that I've seen during the, the COVID pandemic is significant. And I think there's a lot of human connection and human conversation that's occurring right now, even when people can't see each other all the time face to face. As we will discuss our purpose for naming this season one effective philanthropy in a later episode with our president, Julia Prochan, Claire hits home on some of the light brought out in an otherwise dark and heavy year. The, the activities of the summer due to the, due to the police killings caused many organizations to dig deeper to reflect more, to make that commitment, and to change the way looking at their hiring, looking at um, the constituents they were serving, making sure they had more community representation, just becoming more authentic. In many instances, organizations have used this time to get closer to the people they were working with and also to closer with each other. I think I saw more collaboration between and among nonprofits than had been the case previously. And that part is really, really touching and, and something that I hope will, will uh, come together long term. Overall, the, the toll and tally through this pandemic is going to find that people have been very generous. Uh, their individual giving is quite high right now. My biggest takeaway was the importance of having meaningful conversations and listening to others. The context of this takeaway was talking about making meaningful change in Boston communities, but I think it goes far beyond Boston and philanthropy. Well, one thing I would say is that unfortunately we're not all stuck in our homes. And that is part of the issue about having conversations with a lot of folks. I know a lot of essential workers, uh, and those folks are still having to go out. The buses that go by me on the corner are still filled. Um, so, you know, part of it is just having a worldview that is very broad to some extent. And I have great colleagues that keep me apprised of things within the foundation. We've got a staff of 13, and we all communicate fairly well. It's a lot of conversations with folks in the course of my week and my day. Um, it's a lot of thinking. And I, I wouldn't, you know, pat myself on the shoulder or pat the foundation on the shoulder that we have a magic answer to this because I do think that you can only get so much information from Zoom calls. So the kind of high-touch philanthropy that we're used to participating in has suffered 
in these last two years, and we're hoping that we're making the right bets. We're reading the same newspapers as everyone else, um, having a lot of the same calls. There's certainly been some resources, both through national convenings. We're a member of Funders Together to End Homelessness, which has had regular discussions, not just with funders, but also with nonprofit partners that have very high participation of folks that are directly affected with lived experience. So we do get some feedback and they're also hoping to develop policy issues issues and um, policy platforms that get passed on to other people in public, it, public administration and various federal agencies. We also hear from you know friends and neighbors, just like everyone else. And so part of that is when you hear something that either doesn't confirm or challenges a grant you've made or an idea you've had, I just have the responsibility to try and weigh that and listen and think and try and seek out other sources of information and the the reverse is true as well. When when something that you've done gets confirmed, you say, okay, good. So if you make a grant, which Liberty did uh, to community health centers during the testing phase to get, um, there was 1.2 million that was granted to community health centers. They aren't normally a constituent of us. Health care isn't a large focus. But it was evident that communities of color in particular were lagging behind in terms of COVID testing. So we made grants to a, a, a certain number of community health centers that were well situated and had a very multicultural, multilingual population of clients. And when I look in the community newspapers or when I hear from people that um, they win XYZ or when I'm out going to the grocery store and I see the van from a Whittier Street, from a Demick, or a walk-in site established, then you have some confirmation that that line that's there is there because that community health center, in fact, responded to a need. And so that is some of the ways that we verify the work. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Fill and Topic with TCPL. In our next episode, we will unpack this theme of effective philanthropy that we deemed the theme of season one.